there with this deadly winter storm moving up to the northeast with heavy snow knocking out power to parts of the Midwest. And as that happens, we're hearing from the families of the women killed by those tornadoes in Louisiana. We are live on the ground there and in Minnesota. Plus, look at markets tanking, right, with Wall Street really concerned that moves by the Federal Reserve could push the economy into a recession. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And breaking in just the last hour or so, you've got a jury finding a white Texas police officer guilty of manslaughter, not murder, for shooting and killing a black woman in her home. What happened inside that courtroom? Then in the backstory, a behind the scenes look at an NBC News exclusive on why Texas parents say their school district isn't doing anything to tackle the racism directed at their kids. And in tonight's original, we're going to take you inside the battle over drag shows in America, how the LGBTQ plus community is hoping to fight back against the far right later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And listen, right now we are monitoring a tornado that apparently has just touched down in St. Petersburg, Florida, as we speak, as we're coming on the air. This is according to the National Weather Service. This is what we've seen in places around the country, especially in the south, again and again, as part of this massive storm that's on its way to the northeast right now. More than 24 million people are staring down this dangerous and deadly weather that is wiping out houses, ripping up power lines. You can see it. We talked about Louisiana, that tornado we told you about live on our air 24 hours ago ripping through New Orleans. This is the path that it left behind. In Colonia, you can see the homes just, listen, they are smashed up. Roof after roof torn through in Araby. This town just got hit by a big tornado back in March, and now they've got to deal with yet another recovery. We know three people have been killed so far with the daughter of Allison Alexander, one of those victims, telling our New Orleans station what her mom meant to her. She means, meant, uh, still means the world to me, and if anybody knew her, and knew my mama, they know that she would give anybody the clothes off her back. Up north, we are seeing a ton of snow. Like, do you know how hard it is to get record snow in Duluth, Minnesota? It is very hard, and yet it is one of the top five snowiest days ever there, 18 inches in 36 hours. And the big worry on that front, the snow front, is the power going out right when people desperately need to keep their homes warm. You've got more than 100,000 folks across Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota in the dark as we speak. We're going to talk more about that cold weather with Miguel Almaguer in a second. But I want to start with Morgan Chesky on the ground in Louisiana. And Morgan, you've obviously got the situation that you've seen in Louisiana with those tornadoes. We're getting reports of that tornado touching down now in St. Petersburg, Florida. The devastation behind you is what so many people are bracing for tonight. Yeah, Hallie, this is all part of this massive system that, as you mentioned, in Florida is far from over. That tornado, we do know, has damaged several buildings. We're still getting damage reports in by the minute. Uh, and this is just a testament to the sheer size of this storm system that two days ago struck near Dallas, Texas, then northwest Louisiana, and early today or late yesterday, uh, here in Kelowna, Louisiana. This is just upriver from New Orleans. Uh, and just a peek over my shoulder will show you the extent of the damage here. Power crews have been on the scene all day long trying to restore electricity to this area. And Hallie, really, as long as you can see down this block, uh, homes are total losses or significantly damaged. Important to note, just on the other side of the street here, Homes almost untouched, just a, a testament to the indiscriminate nature uh, and the isolated nature that these uh, tornadoes bring when it comes to damage. I had a chance to hear from uh, one resident earlier today, and here's what they had to say uh, about this horrific ordeal. Take a listen. I'm so grateful to God that no one in this neighborhood was significantly injured, but I feel, because I know some of these houses have had damage from different hurricanes, in the past. Um, so, yeah, I'm just at a loss. And unfortunately, while certain neighborhoods did not have any significant injuries here in Kelowna, uh, there was one fatality, a 56-year-old woman. Uh, more than half a dozen people were injured, but none of those injuries are expected to be life-threatening at this time. Uh, of course, Louisiana's governor speaking today that they're going to help however they can. Uh, but as you can see from the damage behind me, these folks need pretty much everything right now. Yeah, Allie. they need all the help they can get. Morgan Chesky, thank you very much. Miguel Almaguer is standing by for us in Duluth, Minnesota. Miguel, we talk about the blizzard warning that is still in effect there. You've got the power outages. And looking at the road behind you, I assume it used to be a road. It's not like it's real easy to get help to people who need it right now. Yeah, Hallie, the big problem for folks here, the good news is the storm has passed. The big problem is 
Look what's left behind. There's several inches of snow here. We've had about two feet of snow here just from this storm alone. The sidewalks are really caked with snow that haven't been cleaned out. Take a look. This is like a, a typical sidewalk here across this area. I mean, this is several feet deep right here. And the accumulation you see here is really all across the area. And that points to the big problem here. It's the roads. There have been spin outs. Yeah. There have been uh, cars that have flipped over. There have been massive delays all across this area. Some truckers in the Wyoming and the Dakotas area say they were on the road for more than 30 hours. Now, the good news again, we had those terrible blizzard like conditions here earlier this morning. For the most part, that weather system seems to have moved out of this area. We just have the very tail end of that happening right now. It is moving east. This is the wet, sloppy side of the storm. It's bringing all of this snow. Hallie, we came to you on Monday from California where they had okay. four feet of snow. Now, here we are on Thursday. They've got several inches here in Duluth. It's a record storm, as you mentioned. These folks are hard. They're used to weather like this. But this one was still historic, Hallie. And that's the thing, Miguel. There is nothing that annoys me more than when news people like say it's winter, it's cold, it's snowing. That's what happens in the winter. But this is different, right? I mean, this was to the level that people in Duluth, where you are, really haven't seen in a long time and, and don't see often. Absolutely. I mean, the folks here, again, are used to these winter yeah. storms, but this one was different. Right now, we're thinking it's the fourth, fifth, or it's, it's in the top 10 uh, snow level storms that have hit this area. In terms of December, it's certainly in the top five. I mean, this is an area that gets snow, but hardly, rarely do they get this much snow this fast. We were driving around here this, air, this morning to get into our live shot. It was blizzard-like conditions. The visibility was next to zero. Folks were hunkering down. They know what to do here when stuff like this happens. Very few people were we're coming out of their homes. It's just in the last few hours now that the snow has finally slowed that they're starting to clean the roads and really dig out. And I guess that storm, Miguel, I don't know if you're going to continue to head east, but I'm sure I'll see you closer to my neck of the woods as this storm keeps moving its way through the country. Miguel Almaguer, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's talk about the economic picture we're getting today because, oof, stocks, they are down. They are way down today after a new report showing Americans backed off on buying stuff more than people expected them to. Look at the Dow. It's worst day since September, closing down more than 2%. I hate to show you the red of the S&P and the NASDAQ as well, but that's what it is. That's what it looks like, folks. This report today from the Commerce Department says people are not spending as much money on furniture and electronics and clothes. They are spending more money at the grocery store and at restaurants. This is the latest evidence of inflation making people more selective about what they're buying this time of year. And then, of course, there are those interest rate hikes that have investors worried about a recession. Joining me now is Brian Chung. So, Brian, based on what we saw from the retail numbers today, it seems like people are cooling it on their spending, maybe a sign that those interest rate hikes are working. But obviously, Wall Street is worried here. Talk us through it. Yeah, well, it's important to remember that the market is not the economy, but at the we same love time, that phrase around here, right? Yes. But but we, markets we are worried that. about everybody. What everybody else is worried about as well, and that is whether or not the recessionary fears that are looming out there can be actualized and seen in 2023. And when you take a look at this report that we got this morning showing that retail sales contracted by 0.6 percent in a November, which, by the way, is usually a really busy time of the year for Christmas spending, for holiday spending, and you see the categories where we saw price declines in car parts, in furniture, in computers, in clothing. So people did not go out and aggressively spend as much as retailers had hoped for. And the concern is, as we get into 2023, is that a precursor for even further slowdowns in economic activity? The Federal Reserve just made borrowing costs more expensive yesterday. They're going to continue to tighten on this economy. How hard do they stop economic activity? That's something everyday Americans and also Wall Street are concerned about on this Thursday. What does this mean for stores, right, for retailers? You think the week after Christmas, people go and return all the stuff they got for the holidays that they don't actually want or need? With this new survey out from the National Retail Federation, finding it's going to be like $170 billion worth of stuff that people will take back. What does this mean for stores? How does that play into the bigger picture? Or is it kind of baked in? Yeah, well, look, no one likes to have the gift that they gave someone returned, but especially not so this year. And the reason is because the stores don't want them either. Think about all the inventory glut that they've had. A lot of supply chain backups in 2021 in the beginning of this year led to overordering by the likes of Target and Walmart and all these other clothing stores. So their warehouses were stuffed to the brim headed into this holiday season. They do not want people to return those things. That's actually why we also saw some stores even change their return policies, make them a little bit more stringent. But the expectation is still for Americans that maybe got stuff and they just want the cash or the credit instead to go and return them, that's going to be a big story and maybe that's going to be a pressure on these uh, corporate margins as well in 2023. Brian Chung, thank you very much for that. We've got some breaking news to get to because not too long ago we saw a Texas jury 
finding former police officer Aaron Dean guilty of manslaughter, not murder, in the death of a 28-year-old black woman, a Tatiana Jefferson, in 2019. Dean, who is white, faces up to 20 years in prison. Dean shot and killed Jefferson through a window of her home after responding to a non-emergency wellness call by a neighbor who noticed an open front door. The defense argued that Dean fired his gun in self-defense, but prosecutors say that he fired because Jefferson uh, pointed a gun at him. The judge warned people in the court not to react to the verdict, saying he wouldn't hesitate to issue sanctions. Jefferson's family members didn't show much reaction when the verdict was read. No comment yet from them or from Dean's attorneys. Danny Savalos is, is joining us now. And Danny, the reason that, that we're emphasizing here, manslaughter, not murder, prosecutors wanted murder. They had argued for that more serious charge. They didn't get it from this jury. Why not? We may never know what exactly the jury discussed in that jury room, but apparently they struggled with finding him guilty of specific intent murder, finding that he had the intent to kill, uh, instead of finding that he was highly reckless, that he was aware of a risk and he disregarded it. Uh, that is the state of mind required for reckless manslaughter, which is what he was convicted of. And it was a lesser included offense. And any time a judge instructs a jury on a lesser included offense, it does increase uh, the odds in the defense's view, at least, that the jury will split the difference as a compromise, maybe. And that could be what happened here. Uh, maybe they were debating in the jury room and they thought, well, at least we can agree that he was reckless. Uh, that's why those lesser inclu included offenses can get a conviction. It may not be what the prosecution originally wanted, but it is a conviction nonetheless. And one with some pretty serious penalties, anywhere from two to 20 years, which is a lot less than murder in the state of Texas, which is five uh, to 99 to life, uh, but still a very significant jail time involved. We heard from Tatiana, Jefferson's 11-year-old nephew, who was with her that night. Um, they were playing video games, actually. Dean also took the stand in his own defense, saying he saw the barrel of a gun pointed at him. Talk through the testimony here, because prosecutors had argued that um, Jefferson, upon hearing a noise in her yard, not knowing who was there, right, in her own home with a right to self-defense, was, was at the window with a gun. The defense obviously argues something very different. The last couple of years have seen a break from the traditional rule that a defense attorney never, ever, ever puts his client on the stand. And more and more we see in high profile cases and specifically in cases involving excessive force by police officers, especially ones asserting self-defense, that they do take the stand for a couple of different reasons. Number one, police officers are absolute pros at testifying, better than judges, better than lawyers. Cops do it every day on the stand in state court. And secondly, in the case of self-defense, uh, often there's only one person left to tell the story, and that is, in this case, the police officer, the shooter. And so for that reason, the defense must have thought that he gave them their best chance to establish a self-defense defense and possibly win an acquittal. I bet going into this, the defense was feeling pretty good about their odds uh, when the jury came to verdict. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for that breakdown. Appreciate it. Let's take it to what's going on at the White House today, because they're saying it could be a very different winter if people get properly protected from COVID. So to do that, they are laying out their game plan to avoid a winter wave of infection. Starts with another round of free at-home tests. Four of them, you can get them online, cost you zero dollars. They're also going to push the vaccine effort in nursing homes for people who live and work there. And stockpile supplies for states who see serious outbreaks. But there are some big obstacles for each of those things. Right? You've got Congress not giving the White House more money to pay for those tests at this point. You've got people in nursing homes who are not just not only not getting the shots, fewer than half of residents and about fifth of staff. And states that are kind of apprehensive when it comes to anything to do with COVID, like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who says he's launching investigations into vaccines. I talked with the White House coronavirus coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. He's telling me, listen, if people get vaccinated, if people get treated, then the U.S. should be OK this winter. But if people don't, it could be rough. Watch. If that doesn't happen, uh, then I think a lot of us are very concerned about what our health care systems can be able to manage in the days and weeks ahead. That feels ominous, Dr. Jha. Well, I'm not trying to, it's not about, be, you know, about being scared. It's about taking action, right? Like the good news here is that we have the capability to manage this. But if we deploy them, if we use them. Mike Memoli is live for us at the White House. And, ma'am, I got to be honest with you. I had that conversation with Dr. Jha. He was really on message about getting boosted. We watched the White House briefing, right? Really on message about people getting boosted. Um, the question is, why aren't people doing that? Because about 13 percent, 14 percent roughly, of Americans have actually gotten the updated booster shot. Um, 
it, it feels like there is a messaging disconnect here. I want to play for you one more thing that I said to Dr. Jha on this topic. Watch. What has to change to get that number higher? Because what's been happening so far doesn't seem to be getting through to people. Yeah, so when you look at prior uh, waves of infection that we've had, um, when infection numbers go up, you do see people go out and get vaccinated. Uh, we wanted people to do it before numbers started rising because that's the best way to protect yourself. Um, but, but, you know, so, so I do expect that we're going to see more vaccinations. The messaging piece of this, ma'am, how much is that a conversation behind closed doors at the White House as they're out with this winter push today? So, Hallie, it's interesting because we have seen the White House trying to get out in front of an expected winter surge. We had the First Lady doing an event with Dr. Fauci uh, last week. We had Dr. Fauci in the briefing room just a couple weeks ago. But I think they're really struggling here, and Dr. Jha hit on it, with this idea that we've gotten back to normal. How many people do we know are back to holiday parties, are back to some of these traditions that had been abandoned in past years? And while there is likely going to be a spike, if you look at the numbers, at least specifically deaths, I think, is an important metric. They were far down from where they were a year ago and two years ago at a winter surge. And so the White House is trying to build up a little urgency here. But, you know, I'm going to quote Joe Biden to you, President Biden here. He'll often say, don't show me your budget. Uh, don't, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. Well, look at the president's schedule. He hasn't really engaged on this himself in a meaningful way. Now, White House officials aren't ruling out that we will hear from the president on this next week heading into the holidays. And I think you have to just remember where we were last year. Do you remember how long those lines for testing were around yeah. the block? You know, people were really struggling to get COVID tests ahead of the holidays. That's, I think, the headline of what they're announcing today in what is otherwise a lot of repackaged old initiatives, trying to get those COVID tests out to the American people uh, to try to avoid what they faced last year, which was a real crisis around testing. Yeah, and, and the question mark becomes, what is going to be different? How can this year be different at this point? And what can public health officials do about it? The president has also, just a few months ago, ma'am, you know, suggested that the pandemic is functionally over. Now, mm -hmm. Dr. Zha will push back on that and say, well, there was more context around that. He also that's said that right. COVID that's isn't over. But I wonder if that's, it feels a little semantics. I don't know. Yeah, I think that is part of this idea that we've gotten back to reality that the White House is going up against. And the real, I think, interesting part of today's announcements was an acknowledgement that they have kind of run out of money and they're struggling to sort of move around pots of money to do the things that need to be done. Uh, for instance, this latest batch of tests, the money is, uh, you know, it's part of the stockpile that still exists, but there isn't likely to be money for additional down the, down the road. They had to pause, remember, this testing program in the fall because they wanted to have enough supply now. And what do we know is happening? happening. The Congress right now, they're struggling to get a, a budget deal together. They want to include COVID funding there. It's not clear if there is any significant amount. And once Republicans take the reins in the House, it's going to be that much harder to get funding. And so there's a real push uh, now to try to at least get uh, through this winter surge and then hope yeah. that the trend lines continue to improve. As shallow of a winter wave as possible is what I think they're hoping to see. Mike Memoli, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Tonight, you've got Georgia and New Hampshire, now the newest state banning TikTok on state employees' phones, laptops, et cetera. Now, again, government phones, but there are now about a dozen states that have done this kind of thing as a bill is making its way through Congress that would ban the app on the government phones of federal employees, too. Let me just reiterate, not a ban on TikTok on your phone, okay? But if you are a government employee with a government phone, that's what it would affect. This is something that has been in the works for years after lawmakers and U.S. national security agencies raised red flags about the parent company of TikTok, a China-based company called ByteDance, worried that China could access Americans' data, spy on them, basically. I talked with one TikTok policy advisor today who tells me they are committed to protecting Americans. Watch. The legislation that you've seen um, in the states and um, in the Senate doesn't actually solve any real problem at all. We've been working with the federal government um, on a solution that we believe solves um, any perceived problem with TikTok beyond a shadow of a doubt. Joining me now is Ryan Nobles from Capitol Hill. So, Ryan, what is so interesting about this moment that we're in is growing governmental pressure, right, on TikTok to do something different. And it comes at a time when TikTok is working out a deal, basically, trying to, with the Justice Department, to keep operating in the United States to address some of these security concerns. There's a lot going on. What is the momentum on the Hill for moving forward with some kind of a ban, whether it be on government phones or whether it be more broadly on all Americans? 
Well, just look at the vote last night, Hallie. Uh, 100 to nothing. Basically, every single United States senator, Republican and Democrat voted for that. There aren't too many uh, bills that you see sail through the United States Senate with such ease. Now, it remains to be seen whether or not the House will even take up the measure. We are running out of time uh, in this congressional calendar. But there certainly seems to be a growing sense of urgency among members of Congress that TikTok could be a threat to national security, not just uh, from on government phones and with government employees, but more uh, broadly just within the American public itself. So we do think it's heading in this direction. You know, uh, the speaker was unclear today as to whether or not the House will end up voting on this, but it is clear that, at least broadly, members of Congress are concerned about the influence and impact uh, that TikTok has on the United States, and they really do want to see something done to try and rein it in. What about the sort of perspective from TikTok, because there are some lawmakers who use TikTok, who are on the mm -hmm. platform. There are Americans. We talk about this a lot here on this show. It's really popular, not like for fun. I also talked with, um, our team talked with one, one cybersecurity expert today who was like, it started as a karaoke app, and, it, and it's, it's more than that now, right? It's more than singing and dancing. People get their news from it. One in four Americans under the age of 30, for example. So how much is that being considered on Capitol Hill when this discussion comes up? The fact that it is something hugely popular. Yeah. I think that's a big part of it, Hallie. I mean, it, it's very difficult to, to excuse the cliche, but put the genie back in the bottle. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of Americans that use TikTok on a daily basis. Uh, so the idea that you're just going to ban it outright uh, would it would take a ton of work. And and that's just, you know, from just a consumer perspective, the idea that there are so many people using it. Then there's also the idea of who exactly do you ban it from? Do you tell uh, these app stores like Google and Apple's app store that they can no longer provide it. Well, then you're getting into a whole nother question about First Amendment issues. It will likely lead to uh, legal uh, proceedings and litigation surrounding it. So there are not easy solutions to this problem when you're talking about something that is so popular and is so ubiquitous in American society. And you're right, does have practical uh, purposes beyond just entertainment. So these are all the things that they're wrestling with. But make no mistake, Hallie, even though uh, Americans do love TikTok and are spending a lot of time on it, you know, you talk to intelligence officials, it is something they are very concerned about. They do believe that the Chinese government could use this for nefarious right. purposes, and that's why they're trying to find a solution here. Chris Ray, for example, testifying about this just a month ago, the director of national intelligence telling our colleague Andrew Mitchell that she has concerns about it. Ryan Nobles, thank you for watching this one. Speaking of things going down on the Hill or getting ready to go down on the Hill, let's talk about January 6th, the select committee and its big report that is apparently getting sent to the printer as we speak ahead of a big public meeting Monday, one o'clock Eastern. The big thing they're getting ready, criminal referrals that they expect to make to the Justice Department. This committee has been meeting basically every day almost to make sure that that stuff is ready because they know they don't have a lot of time left, right? The end of Congress, end of the year means the end of this committee too. But here's the thing, these referrals, it's not like this is something you'd see in front of a grand jury, right? A subpoena like that. The House cannot actually, like if this committee makes these criminal referrals over to the Department of Justice, it's mostly symbolic. It doesn't have legal teeth per se. Ali Vitali is on Capitol Hill. Ali, um, help us understand what we expect to see on Monday, because I think the big headline, the way that I'm thinking about it is, we're going to know more about these criminal referrals, which even if they don't yeah. have legal teeth, will be symbolic. They will, they will sort of matter, at least optically here. What else beyond yeah. that? What do we know about that? It's like a kind of politically tough Christmas card that's going to be sent to the Department of Justice. And I say politically tough because the DOJ doesn't have to do anything if a criminal referral is sent. They're going to make their own decisions. We know they're impaneling their own grand juries and doing their own investigations of January 6th and the efforts done by the former president and people in his orbit to potentially overturn the results of the election. So those things are happening regardless. But you're right that optically it's going to be really important what we end up seeing on Monday in in large part because this committee has really walked us through over the course of the last few months the blueprint for what we're going to see them lay out on Monday and then of course on Wednesday when we actually see the final report, the chapters even down to the theme could likely mimic the, the, the so-called you know, chapter headings that we heard in the hearings over the summer. So really, we've already seen in large part much of the things that they're going to lay out. But Monday is critically important because it finally answers the question, not just of who they're criminally referring, but also other referrals that they could make. They could do them to the Ethics Committee here in Congress. That's one way, potentially, that they could get away with 
uh, punishing in some way the Republican lawmakers who didn't respond to the subpoenas. So all of that is going to be really important as we figure out what this committee does as it ends its time. Ali Vitali, live for us there on Capitol Hill. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you back Monday. We're going to have lots more special coverage we'll talk oh, yeah. more about right here on NBC News Now. Coming up here on NBC News Now, Elon Musk selling billions of dollars worth of Tesla shares. Why that could hurt his company. Plus, New York is not going to let you buy some pets at pet stores anymore. That's one of our five things. We'll explain why in a minute. Elon Musk raising some more cash for himself tonight by selling more shares of Tesla worth something like three and a half billion dollars, according to a new SEC filing. So if you add it all up, he's sold about twenty three billion dollars worth of Tesla stock this year. You might be thinking, all right, Hallie, let the guy do what he wants with the shares. I mean, yes, I am. But Tesla investors are worried he's doing this to pay back the debt he took on when he bought Twitter for forty four billion dollars. Tesla shares are now down 61 percent since the start of the year. CNBC reached out to Musk for comment. He did not immediately return that request for comment. Jake Ward is joining us now. And I guess I think, Jake, um, this is super interesting because like, OK, so Musk is selling his shares. But this may be hurting Tesla because, as one report put it, he's using the company. It seems when when analysts said it seems like he's kind of using Tesla as his own personal ATM machine. Well, that's right. And Hallie, you have to remember, right, that his purchase of Twitter was essentially financed by a personal loan. And the collateral for that loan was his uh, te his Tesla shares. So we're, you know, certainly those two things are mixed up together. You know, as you pointed out, right, this is a guy who can do what he wants, right? And it is not a question of him needing the money in any, uh, you know, in the sort of household budgetary sense that you and I might think of, you know, needing money for groceries this week. It's not like that. But what we have seen, of course, in the past is that when he sells Tesla shares, he does it ahead of an anticipated drop in their value. We have seen that over time in the past. And as you mentioned, I mean, his shares are down. I mean, if we'd spoken even 24 hours ago, we would have been saying that his Tesla shares are down 55 percent for the year. This morning, it's 61 percent for the year, right? They are truly falling. And so uh, this seems, you know, this could be just that he's getting out in front of the dip. It could be that he actually needs to pony up some collateral to show his creditors in this Twitter deal. It's not really clear, but certainly it's going to make investors on both sides, I think, pretty nervous. The whole thing, when you step back and look at it, Jake, from the 30,000-foot uh, foot view, is just like, can I say, like, bizarro Musk world here, right? Like, what is up? He got booed at the Dave Chappelle conference a few days ago. He's tweeting about prosecuting Dr. Fauci, dissolving Twitter's content moderation council. I'm not going to ask you, like, what's up with Elon Musk, because I don't think anybody knows here. But, like, could there be consequences fiscally for people who have invested in his companies if this kind of thing keeps going? You know, this is the thing that I think is so interesting. I think you're asking a really smart question here, Hallie, because I think so many of us are thinking to ourselves, okay, there must be some sort some plan, of plan, some strategy to pay here. Well, that's yeah. right. There certainly should be some sort of strategy. And at this point, there is really no clear sense of that, right? A guy who voluntarily goes up on stage at the Dave Chappelle show in San Francisco after he has fired thousands and right. thousands of people and then gets booed for 10 minutes straight, right? That's not a lot of strategic thinking in the real world sense, um, much less all of the stuff he's doing otherwise, right? He's disbanded his trust and safety. Safety Council in advance of, you know, national elections in Tunisia and Nigeria and Turkey, the kinds of things that academics could have told him, bad idea, don't do that, right? There isn't a lot of strategic thinking we're seeing here, um, but it is also not yet clear whether, according to the fundamental currency of running a big company, right, whether in the end this company is going to be stronger financially, fiscally at the end of all of this. That could be a very different outcome from the fact that point. you and I might not enjoy being on the platform as much anymore or might find it a, a place full of conspiracy theories now that he's pushing his it, own personal ones. It's just, you know, those two things, right, whether he'll be punished in the monetary sense, uh, you know, or punished in the sort of, you know, ethical and misinformation sense that we've been talking about so much. You know, I'm not sure that those two worlds are actually aligned, Hallie. I think that's such an interesting point. And also, I, I try to, like, finish your sentence, Jake, but I finished the wrong sentence. Anyways, I see the point that you're making, right? I mean, the, it's the financial fiscal piece that you're, that you're saying here. Um, Jake Ward, thank you. Appreciate you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, German tennis star Boris Becker is back in his home country after serving eight months behind bars in Britain, according to his lawyer. Earlier this year, the Wimbledon champ, he won three times, by the way, was sentenced to 30 months in prison for hiding assets after he was declared bankrupt. Under normal circumstances, he would have had to have served like half the sentence to be eligible for release. 
but he got out early under a fast-track deportation program for foreign nationals. Number two, the House of Representatives here in this country passing a bill today that would let Puerto Rico decide its political future. The bill would let people there vote on whether or not to become a state, an independent country, or to have its own government aligned with the U.S. It still has to pass the Senate before it becomes law. The clock is running out on that one. Number three, several children's hospitals across the U.S. are telling NBC News they're seeing more cases of strep A this season than they usually do. That's when bacteria spreads to parts of the body that typically don't have germs, like the bloodstream. Two little kids in Colorado have died from this since November, and it's not just bad here. At least 15 kids in the U.K. have died since mid-September. The World Health Organization says France, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Sweden are all seeing cases go up, too. Number four, New York Governor Kathy Hochul signing a law banning the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits at pet stores in her state. Her office says it's trying to end the puppy mill to pet store pipeline. The law goes into effect in 2024. Number five, the outgoing Massachusetts governor, Charlie Baker, he's got a new job lined up. The next president of the NCAA. Why? Might have something to do with the political muscle he can flex. The NCAA is trying to push Congress to write up a nationwide standard for how college athletes can make money under those so-called name image likeness rules. Right now, like each state just has its own rules. It's kind of a conglomeration of things, a little confusing. Governor Baker is replacing Mark Emmert, who led the NCAA for 12 years. When we come back, U.S. health officials changing the way they track severe obesity in children. But some skeptics are wondering if it's actually going to help. Stay with us. The CDC today taking steps that it hopes will keep better track of severe obesity in kids. Because basically there are charts that track kids' body mass index, their BMIs as they grow up. And that chart right now cuts off at BMI 37. Now the CADC is expanding it to include higher BMIs, up to 60. So why is this important? The CDC says the percentage of severely obese children has nearly quadrupled in the past five years. Four and a half million children are now considered severely obese, 6% of kids. But there are some doctors who say BMI really isn't that helpful of a metric when it comes to health, since it doesn't tell you where the weight is coming from, whether it's fat or muscle or bone. I want to bring in Dr. John Torres to talk more about it. So um, let's start with the sort of growth chart change in the first place. What's Talk through the logic of the CDC um, directing doctors to do this here. And Hallie, the main reason they did this is because, like you mentioned, the BMI for children only went up to 30. And since about 2000, we started to have this obesity and overweight epidemic, and we're starting to see larger BMIs. And so they said, well, let's go ahead and readjust this. The data for the ones they've been using, which came out in 2003, the BMI chart for children, actually came from 1963 to 1980, children in that time frame. And they didn't have nearly the obesity or overweight problem they have now. So they said, let's go ahead and make this up to date, bring it from 1988 to 2016, and then put that that in the chart as well, but they're still having both charts in there, and they're telling physicians, depending on your child and whether you think the child is in that obese or severely obese category, go ahead and use the new ones. If not, go ahead and use the old ones. But like you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of debate going on as to whether these are very accurate or not. They're helpful if they're used in a proper context, but the thing I think most people have to realize is this is just a very, very early screening device to see if children might be pushed into that category or in that category of overweight and obese, and then starting to look at, yes, are they truly, do they have a high mass of high amount of body fat and where is that body fat because where it is can be different depending on who they are and it could have different health consequences so like you mentioned it can be helpful but it's not the end all for overweightness can you pull on that thread a little bit more of the concerns over bmi as a metric in the first place because there are some who argue it is just severely flawed to the point um, where it, it may it may not be that much of a useful tool it is. It does have limitations. And number one, you know, looking at the limitations, talking about adults. If if there's an adult that's younger, has a lot of body mass because they have muscle mass, they're very athletic, then their BMI is going to be high, and it's going to look like they're overweight and obese when in fact their body fat is very low. On the other hand, for somebody who might be elderly, who has less muscle fat, who has less muscle weight, but isn't necessarily obese, I could put them in the very underweight category. And so it's hard to tell what to do with this once you get that number, other than to continue to look. And with children even more so. But again, this is a very early screening device and just needs to be pushed into it. And the example I give people is essentially it's like saying, I have the sniffles. Well, do you have COVID? Do you have the flu? Do you have RSV? Do you have a cold? Do you have a rhinovirus? It could be a myriad of things. Yeah. So you start going in the direction of what this might be. Same thing here. If the BMI is high, you start thinking, okay, is there something I need to do? And can I use this for educational purposes?
Dr. John Torres, always good to have you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, we're taking you inside one drag community's political fight to save their performances. That's our original tonight from Tennessee. Stay with us. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Out in Northwest Texas, parents say their kids' school district isn't doing anything to address serious incidents of racism at school. Take 14-year-old Brady Kemp in Lubbock. His parents say he's struggling because for months, students have been calling him the N-word in class. Then they started playing noises on the phone that sounded like the crack of a whip. And Tony Hilton talked with Brady and his parents about how the bullying is hurting him. We watched him change, like his mood, not want to go to school or, you know, being sad. I feel like I get looked down at. That wasn't the end of it either. In April, Brady and seven other black students found out their white classmates had created an Instagram page called Laura Bush Middle School Monkeys, where they were asking other kids to send and post pictures of their black classmates. That was the absolute breaking point for Brady's mom, who went to the school. She says the superintendent promised to look into it, but they say they still haven't gotten any answers. The school says the investigation is still happening. Antonia is joining us now. And Antonia, um, it, it, we're so glad to have you back for this segment uh, where it sort of really pulls back the curtain on how this reporting came together. You spent a lot of time in Texas. People know your coverage on South Lake. Did that, um, is that where you found this story regarding this, this family and these families, plural, in Lubbock? In a way, it's how we found the story, because I've spent so much time in Texas over the last two, three years and built so many relationships, particularly with kids who are living in various communities and districts around that very large state. And so in some ways, this came out of that South Lake reporting. A lawyer working with these families reached out to me and to my friend and colleague, Mike Hixenbaugh and gave us a sense of what was going on. And we found out that they were preparing this civil rights filing. And it was important to us not just to tell these students stories of these horrific actions happening in a public school, but also to put this into context for people. Because we're in this moment where in Texas and in many communities around the country, there are parents of minorities, of LGBTQ kids, who are increasingly turning to the federal government and filing claims with the Department of Education because they fear that their local community leaders aren't taking appropriate action on issues surrounding racism and exclusion. And so they want to see the federal government intervene and force these localities to take more action on civil rights. And so, you know, it really was born out of those conversations that we've been having for years. I think people came to trust the two of us in a way yeah. as people who would dig into these stories and really get to the bottom of what was going on. So, you know, while nobody there actually met us while we were in South Lake, those stories are all really connected with the trends that we're seeing in states like Texas, Alley. And one of them is this idea of a focus, and I know this is something you get into in your pieces, on critical race theory, for example, rather than what some parents want to see as a focus confronting the racism that these kids have faced in their school. We were showing some video of you walking with the superintendent, I think it was, um, and I know that you sat down with him. Was it tough to get that interview? Can you talk about that at all? What was fascinating is that he actually immediately wanted to sit down with me and address these issues head on. And I have to say that I had a lot of respect for that because it has been challenging for not just me and Mike, but for reporters all over the country to get school administrators to talk at a time when their jobs have become increasingly politicized. You know, they get criticism from politicians at the local and even up to the federal level. And there have been these movements there to talk less about racism in the classroom to talk less about difference. And that has put a lot of them in the spotlight. And it has also made many educators who tell us all the time behind the scenes that they're fearful of losing their jobs. It's made them afraid to talk about it. And so he actually sat down and addressed these issues. He said that the district has a zero tolerance policy. I would say one part of the conversation where things got a bit complicated, though, is that he said that the district had interviewed hundreds of people about this racist Instagram. And I had to tell him that none of the black students who were victims and actually posted on that Instagram were ever interviewed. And their parents say to this day they still haven't been invited to give their side of the story or their concerns or suspicions about what was going on. And so, you know, this is part of the broader issue here, that administrators are taking actions or following a certain set of rules. And parents are saying that sometimes the reality on the ground looks a lot different than what they're describing on paper. 
Antonia Hilton um, talking more with us about that. Antonia, thank you. It's so good to have you on and your reporting. I really, really appreciate it. We'll look for more of it tonight on NBC Nightly News. Thanks. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. And the latest fight, yet another fight, you could say, considering the conversation we just had in the culture wars in America, relates to drag shows. Across the country, we're seeing lawmakers propose restrictions on these kinds of shows. And at the same time, they're being targeted more and more often by far right groups, these events. Just this year, at least 124 drag events faced anti-LGBTQ protests or significant threats, according to GLAAD, an advocacy group. And the LGBTQ plus community not backing down. NBC's Kathy Park takes us to Tennessee, where some are getting ready to fight back. Veronica Electronica's 21 and Up weekend brunch show is a staple of Nashville's drag scene. But today, the show stops for an announcement. They want to make drag performances illegal if it's in the public view. So right now, if that law passes, I would be committing a potential felony. Just letting you know. Tennessee Republican State Senate Majority Leader Jack Johnson introduced Senate Bill 3. The intent of the legislation is just to simply say that you cannot have sexually explicit entertainment, adult-themed entertainment, in a public venue where kids might be present. The LGBTQ plus community have come out saying, look, um, it targets our community. How, how do you respond to that? Well, I disagree. We're protecting kids and families and parents who want to be able to take their kids to, to public places. We're not attacking anyone or targeting anyone. Uh, I've heard references to this bill that it will ban drag shows. Well, no, it won't. It just says you can't do something that's sexually explicit. It won't prevent someone dressed in drag from being in a parade or being in public. But Veronica and LGBTQ advocates worry this legislation could create misconceptions that drag is inherently sexual. I don't know who will be the drag police um, to judge whether my performance was adult oriented. What does it mean when someone who is dancing shakes their hips? Cheerleaders clearly do it. Dance teams clearly do it. If a drag queen does it, does that suddenly make it sexual? Bianca Del Rio, love that dress. The audience for drag is growing. Drag Story Hour, a nonprofit that holds book readings for kids with drag hosts, went from one chapter in 2015 to 45 in the U.S. today. <laughs> But interest in drag comes amid Republican lawmakers in at least five states considering bills to limit drag when children are present. Reclaim America! Earlier this month, far-right groups, including the Proud Boys and some armed members, shut down an Ohio drag story time. Black, liberty, victory, or death! Tennessee has seen six events targeted, plus swirling outrage online over videos like this one, showing what appears to be children handing dollar bills to a drag performer. There have been news reports about some of these, these events taking place where parents are there with their kids and they were mortified. That's who reached out to me and some of my colleagues and led us to pursue this legislation. For Veronica, outrage like this shows a misunderstanding of drag culture. She says tipping is not sexual. We tip our servers, we tip our bartenders, we tip our hairstylists, and we tip our drag queens. It's just a gesture of appreciation. Senator Johnson plans to move quickly on the bill after the new year. As a parent, you know, it's something that I worry about all the time, you know, what my kids are being exposed to. Now Veronica and her fellow drag queens are ramping up for the political fight of their lives on and off the stage. Kathy Park, NBC News, Nashville. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, three men involved in the plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer in 2020 have been sentenced to prison. They were convicted earlier this year of the charge providing material support for a terrorist act, it's called. One of the men was sentenced to a minimum of 12 years in prison. His son-in-law was sentenced to a decade. Another man was sentenced to seven years. He'll be eligible for parole after serving those terms. From our Western Bureau, officials in Utah say a skier has been rescued after getting caught in an avalanche. Another skier incredibly heard him yelling, found him buried up to his chest in snow. Obviously, he was 
pretty seriously hurt. Rescuers used a helicopter and a snowmobile to get him out of there and to a hospital. And out of our Southeast Bureau, a South Florida Sheriff's deputy dressed up as the Grinch in a school zone this week is a kind of gift to drivers. If people drove a little over the speed limit there, he'd give them a choice, traffic citation or an onion. He's apparently been doing this for like 20 years to teach people a lesson about driving safe in school zones. Listen, if you're going more than five miles an hour above the speed limit, though, no onion option. You are straight up getting a ticket. That's the deal. Coming up. It's going to be a while before we know where exactly the 2030 Winter Olympics will be held. We'll tell you why the International Olympic Committee is holding off on choosing a host city and the climate connection on that front. We are now learning we're not going to know for a while where the Olympics will be held in 2030 because nobody knows where it's going to be cold enough to actually hold the Winter Games in 2030, considering the climate crisis. The International Olympic Committee is now pushing off any decision on the location in a vivid example of just how climate change affects nearly every part of our lives. Here's Vaughn Hilliard with more. David Wise, a three-time Olympic medalist. My third Olympics in Beijing uh, for half-pipe skiing. Has more to worry about than qualifying for the next games. He's ringing the alarm. I'm not a climate expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm a professional half-pipe skier. I do have the opportunity to be kind of the canary in the coal mine. Nearly two decades practicing the winter sport, giving him a unique perspective. Over those 16 years, I've watched the locations we travel to um, become more and more uncertain of if they're going to be able to pull off uh, an event or not. He's not the only one who's noticed. The International Olympic Committee, or IOC, recently announcing it's postponing, setting a venue for the 2030 Winter Olympics, citing concerns over climate change and needing to take, quote, more time to study all these factors and opportunities to make the best possible decisions about future hosting. Dr. Daniel Scott of the University of Waterloo took a look at how climate change could impact Winter Games. Under a high emission scenario, where you'd you'd lose uh, almost two thirds of the of the climate reliable hosts, and it's not just about location; it's also about athlete safety. Even when you have reliable temperatures to make the snow, if your daily temperatures when the competitions are happening are sort of well above freezing, you get those conditions that are really begin to become dangerous for the athletes in all the different snow, snow sports in different ways. With climate change in mind, the IOC will use a different, quote, more flexible approach to choose host cities, even considering a proposal to require host cities to show average minimum temperatures of below zero over a 10-year period. Winter is at risk. Wise joined Protect Our Winters nearly a decade ago with the goal of pushing forward legislation to combat climate change. I have a voice here uh, that people will listen to when it comes to the topic of snow sports. Even joining other Olympians at Capitol Hill to lobby lawmakers on the issue. The actions they say taken today also impacting the next generations of athletes. The pipeline of elite athletes to get to the Winter Olympics is, is shrunk substantially. And so they have some serious concerns about the future of their sport, not just where the Winter Olympics can take place. Vaughn is joining us now. And Vaughn, it's so interesting because we know that the Olympics, in addition to being sort of a global event, also brings a ton of money to the host city. If there's only a few cities that can actually host the Winter Games, does that mean there's could become this kind of permanent host city rotation of just, just a select few? Right, and that's where you see really these three major cities, including Salt Lake City, that are raising their hands at this point. Salt Lake City at the forefront of saying it would like to do it, and that's where the conversation about could they potentially be one of those permanent stops comes into play. One of the other three cities, though, is uh, in British Columbia, and actually the provincial government there is actually kind of uh, walked away a little bit from its own presentation and its own bid, suggesting the $1.2 billion price tag is a lot for it to take on. And and so there's the realities yeah. when you're talking about snow making, infrastructure building. There's a lot that goes into this at a time in which climate is very much of an issue. And it's almost like it's a kind of a little bit of a vicious cycle, right? Because to get the Olympic, cities end up building a lot of new stuff that they didn't already have in many instances, right? And then it just kind of sits there in some cases once the games are over. 
Right, and you were seeing fewer and fewer bidders. There were just two bidders uh, for the Winter Olympics for 2022. Of course, uh, the Winter Olympics were ultimately held earlier this year in Beijing, and it was nearly 100 percent of the snow was man-made. And those are some of the realities. You're talking yeah. about water infrastructure, too, Hallie, because then there's questions about where does that water come from. Of course, if you're talking about the American West, that is no small conversation to be had. And that is where you see this conversation really not only about 2030 and 2034, but also about the future. There was a study done when looking at the past 21 winter host cities, Hallie, and of the 21 host cities, uh, you're looking at an average increase of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit over the last century in those 21 cities. This is wow. a conversation that is going to be had for decades to come. That's for sure. Von Hilliard, thank you very much for that report. Thanks, that does it for us this hour. We'll have more here for you tomorrow. Same time, same place. It is good to be with you. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.